Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Tobacco was Virginia's most valuable crop for centuries. Now organic tobacco is also the top organic crop. Chef John Maxwell takes us back a few decades for a sweet treat for the holidays. And Virginia farmers have been blessed with a loyal friend in Richmond and Washington for 90 years. Welcome back everyone. We are here at the Southern Piedmont Agricultural Research and Extension Center in Blackstone, Virginia. And it's one of the few research centers for tobacco in Virginia. And as Dave Miller reports, there's a certain type of tobacco that's proving it still brings in the big bucks for producers. In 2005, the U.S. Department of Agriculture began phasing out a tobacco quota and price support program that began in the 1930s. The tobacco buyout program allowed many smaller growers to retire or phase out raising the crop without financial strain. As domestic demand for tobacco declined over the years, so had its value to Virginia growers. In 1981, Virginia tobacco crop was worth $266 million. By 2005, it had declined to $61 million. But even as the domestic tobacco market was changing, demand for tobacco exports began to grow. And new customers with new priorities began buying cigarette tobacco, people who wanted to be sure it was produced organically. Well, Virginia growers have found a niche with organic tobacco production, and obviously there's a lot of different organic crops in Virginia, but the organic tobacco, uh, up till now we've had one primary company purchasing this tobacco. Uh, we've got a new international buyer of the tobacco, but I think it fits uh, many of our growers in Virginia very well. Uh, there is a higher income potential for organic tobacco, so I think it fits particularly well for our uh, smaller acreage growers. Surprisingly, Virginia tobacco is the largest organic commodity in Virginia, according to a recent USDA survey. Out of the $49.1 million generated by organic sales in 2015, $18.7 million was attributed to tobacco products. John Bledsoe raises about 78 acres of organic tobacco near Blackstone, Virginia. He starts his crop in a large greenhouse in February, transplants it to the field in late April to early May, and completes his harvest in the early fall. If you would have told me five or six years ago that I was going to grow organic, I would have said you were crazy. But uh, the main reason I do it is for monetary. It's a lot more labor intensive, and if you look back, we probably put as much labor into uh, an acre of tobacco as we did 50 years ago. And we, they really suggest and recommend us not using mechanical labor, uh, using more hand labor. While tobacco represents 38% of all organic farm sales, it is in familiar company. Organically produced broiler chickens and milk were also top sellers. Organic vegetables and other crops rounded out the top five categories. The general public has uh, an affinity for all things organic. Now the, the tobacco companies that are selling organic cigarettes, they do not make any claims regarding the, the safety or the health uh, aspect of organic tobacco, organic tobacco products. But uh, I think there may be a tendency to, uh, or the cigarettes that they are, are formulating with this tobacco is really all tobacco, not a lot of additives. Bledsoe raises his tobacco under contract for Santa Fe Natural. He says in a way they've gone back to much older production methods. That's because the buyer will test for chemical residues on all the leaf he sends in. It, it is difficult and it takes, 
I think you're a little bit more at the hands of Mother Nature because you don't have the chemicals to with the herbicides, with the weeds, and we have growths, which are, we call locally suckers that come in between the tobacco that we, it, we, we used to put a uh, contact on it, and we have to do a lot of it by hand, and that's why they do, do not encourage the mechanical harvest. But uh, some way or another, people are always going to smoke, and that's my opinion. After somewhat of a decline in 2005, tobacco production of all types has rebounded in the Old Dominion. Tobacco sales brought more than $106 million back to the farm last year. But in the decades since the buyout, most growers have much larger farm operations than in the past. Reed says organic tobacco offers smaller growers a good income and an opportunity to grow tobacco on as little as 40 acres of land. In Nottoway County, this is Dave Miller. Tobacco has been grown in Virginia for four centuries, ever since the Jamestown colony was founded. It was the first cash crop that allowed the settlers to survive economically. And tobacco's unique growing conditions led to the rapid expansion of the frontier. Because tobacco drains soil of key nutrients, growers had to be constantly seeking fresh land for good crops. That's why early English colonists claimed settlement lands as far west as the Ohio River Valley and Kentucky. Tobacco production also determined much of the colony's landscape. Many of Virginia's oldest cities, like Alexandria, Danville, and Richmond, were built at tobacco shipping points. I'm Mark Diet. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about cutting some evergreens during the winter months for your holiday decorating. Stay with us. Dazzling lights on winter nights will put you in the mood this holiday season. It's the Illuminate Light Show in Santa's Village at Meadow Event Park, November 18th through January 1st. This spectacular holiday lighting event takes travelers through a musical showcase of color, lights, and design. Giant animated displays and illuminated trees lead to Santa's Village, where families can visit Santa Claus and enjoy the sights and magic of Christmas. To learn more, go to IlluminateLightShow.com. Decorating with evergreens is very popular during the holidays, but Mark Viette warns us you need to be cautious where you take your clippings in the garden. Some of you might know what this is. This is known as winterberry, and it really is a winterberry. There's also fall berries, but the fall berries usually drop before winter gets here. The variety of this one, which is one of my favorite, is Maryland Beauty. And it is a holly, but it's a holly that loses its leaves, so it's really not a true evergreen. And you can go in the winter months and prune this one without any problem at all for your decorating. And so what we'll do is we'll just cut two stems here and then I'll take you to some fantastic evergreens that you can also trim for your holiday decorating. You can grow all your own evergreens and plant material to harvest during the winter months. Now, winter months is not the ideal time to prune most of these things. But we're really not pruning. We're going in by hand and selectively pruning out small branches here and there. With most evergreens or many evergreens, you can only cut them back so far. This here is a Swiss stone pine. And on pine trees, you can only go about three years back into growth. And if you go back four or five years, you're just going to leave stubs that will never produce new greens. And here on this camisipris here, I just cut a, a long branch. And as you look inside the branch, there are still buds and growing areas that you can prune up to. But again, I'm only going to prune pieces like this, nice and short, which still allow for more growth. Within this area, we have other types of camisipris and cypress. We have junipers. We have uh, dwarf blue spruce. And uh, we're going to go to one of my favorite junipers, the Hetzai juniper, which you can cut back hard. And you'll learn this over years. So you don't have to go and ask your neighbor, can I go ahead and prune a few evergreen pieces? You can have this right in your own backyard. This is a big growing juniper. It's known as the Hetzai 
juniper. And it is one you can cut back and it will regrow. And I'm just gonna make a simple swag. So I'm gonna come in here, cut this like so. It's that easy. And then I'm gonna take some of the other evergreens and they would just be wired on right where my hand is. And if I want, I can go ahead and add some red berries. That'll be wired just like that. And a nice bow put right here. And you just take this and you hang it on your door. Real easy, simple. It's an arrangement you can make in just a couple minutes. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Peanuts are a favorite holiday treat in the Old Dominion. Chef John Maxwell shows us how easy it is to put together a peanut pie. That's next in the heart of the home. <laughs> From our farms to your table, Virginia dairy farm families are dedicated to providing your family with nutritious, high-quality milk. I'm Dan Myers fifth generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I'm Roy Vanderhyde, a first generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I'm Gerald Heatwool, a third generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I am dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and our land. Nothing topped off a holiday meal like a fresh baked pie. Today, Chef John Maxwell shares his recipe for a Virginia favorite in the heart of the home. Hi, welcome to the heart of the home. I'm Chef John Maxwell and we're here at Meadow Hall at Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia. And we're gonna be playing with some great Virginia food. Today, we've got a real special treat for you. Uh, one of the most important commodities in Virginia agriculture are, are peanuts. And we're going to be making a peanut pie here that's a, a reasonable amount of sugar, and depending on who you are, reasonable has its own de definition. But it's sugar with peanuts and, and uh, some corn syrup. So we're going to tighten it with eggs. It's pretty easy to make. We're going to get started here. I'm melting a couple of tablespoons of butter in the bottom of this pan. Get that warm. While that's happening, I'm going to crack these eggs into this bowl because we want them slightly whipped. Now, you notice that I didn't crack it on the side of the bowl, right? I don't like cracking eggs on the side of the bowl because it drives the shell into the egg, and you can get bacteria and bits of shell into your egg if you do this, if you just leave it f flat on the side, right? Right, then you, you've got good clean eggs with no bits of shell in them. And I'm just going to just whisk these up a bit. We don't have to whisk them real frothy or anything. Just want to get all the yellow and the white kind of mixed together. All right. So now this is melting. Right, and I'm going to add some sugar, about a cup. and I'm gonna add a cup of corn syrup. Now this is a 16 ounce bottle, and we all know that a cup is eight ounces, so I can just, don't have to dirty another cup here, I can just take half this bottle and throw it in there. Uh, this is not, we're not making a commercial production run here, so if I'm a little over or a little short, it isn't gonna hurt, it isn't gonna hurt the recipe. All right, so there we go. Now I'm gonna stir this around and bring it up to a boil. Now, I don't always mention exactly how much of every ingredient I'm putting into the, into the recipe, 
But you can get these recipes at my website, chefjohnmaxwell.com, and print them out when you're ready to, to do that. So you can have the, the video on how to do it and the written thing on how much of everything to do, and you can be pretty successful that way. So just going to take a couple of more seconds here for this to bring up to a boil. We want to get it a boil because that'll dissolve the sugar so it won't be all granulated and crunchy. And then once that's done, we'll pull it off the heat and, and mix in the, the egg yolks, or the eggs, rather. And that's about ready. I'm going to cut this heat off. Right. Right. Pull it off. And now I'm going to add these eggs. But I've got to whisk them. Right want to add them because so, I don't want scrambled eggs. And if my sugar is too hot, when I put the, egg yolk, the whipped eggs in there, I'll just scramble the eggs and it won't tighten up the, um, the pie. Now there's two different ways to do this. Right? The recipe itself calls for us to put the peanuts into the syrup and then pour the syrup and peanuts into the pie crust. I like to put the, the peanuts into the pie crust that way, All right? And then add the batter. I like to do this because if I add the peanuts to the batter too soon, some of the crisp will come off of the peanuts. They'll absorb too much of the liquid too quickly, and I won't have a, a good crunch on my peanut pie. I'm going to set that over here. So now that that's ready, I'm going to put this into the oven. Right. That pie is just about ready. I'm going to add a little bit of sugar to this bowl. Uh, it's a couple of tablespoons, maybe, because I just want to sweeten this cream up. I got some heavy cream. I'm going to put about, about half a cup in here. And I'm going to whip this up with a little bit of vanilla, a couple of drops of vanilla. Right. Now I'm going to make some whipped cream. Now I'm not going to make this whipped cream like, like comes out of an aerosol can. This is going to be softer, right? but it'll be just as sweet, and it'll kind of ooze over that hot pie. Just about there, you can see the ribbons in it. I don't know whether we can see that white on white in the, in the camera, but you can see how when I pull it through, it, it holds its shape, and that's what I'm looking for. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Let me move this over so I can get this centered here for the shot. Here we've got a peanut pie. I'm gonna take a plate here, cut this. That should do it. Now it comes. Bit of this cream. Now we've got a peanut pie from Virginia. Using Virginia products, good fresh dairy, can't beat that. Every week, we make recipes using great Virginia-grown food. We make them in our kitchen, so you can make them in your kitchen. Join us next week on Heart of the Home, when we get to play with more great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on Chef Maxwell's website, chefjohnmaxwell.com. Peanuts are not native to Virginia. Scientists believe they were first cultivated in Brazil or Peru. They were carried to Africa by early European explorers and missionaries and back across the ocean to Virginia. The first commercial peanut crop was grown in Sussex County in the early 1840s. It was not a valuable crop for another 60 years when the boll weevil destroyed the South's cotton crop 
and farmers were desperate for an alternative to make money. Peanuts are grown in nine localities in southeastern Virginia today. About 19,000 acres of peanuts were planted in 2015 in Virginia, worth about $15.8 million to growers. Virginia farmers have a very loyal friend in both Richmond, Virginia and Washington, D.C. As Norm Hyde reports, the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation is celebrating an important anniversary as the state's largest farm group. The Virginia Farm Bureau and other state farm bureaus began early in the 20th century as lobbying groups representing the economic and social interests of farmers. Early organizations were strong in southwest Virginia and the Shenandoah Valley. 1926 is the official charter date for the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation, which for years had just one or two employees and an elected president. But current President Wayne Pryor says it grew and thrived because the sole purpose was to speak for farmers. Lots of different organizations have a purpose, and therefore I think Farm Bureau has a true purpose, and that purpose is to represent agriculture. And being the largest organization representing agriculture in the state um, is very needed and, and has been very successful. Pryor grew up in a Farm Bureau family in Goochland County. His father was the first county Farm Bureau insurance agent, and he worked with farmers on farm issues as well. Pryor rose through the ranks to become Farm Bureau's 12th president a decade ago. My home was the county Farm Bureau office. My mother was his secretary. And many times I remember her pushing breakfast dishes back from the table. He had made a sale the night before, and she would sit down and hand copy that application for him to send in that day. Today, the Virginia Farm Bureau is the state's largest farm lobbying group. It also provides a number of economic services to members, like grain marketing and equipment parts. And in 2011, the Farm Bureau bought the State Fair of Virginia. To celebrate the Farm Bureau's many modern milestones, a new book was commissioned to cover the achievements since 1982. Author Greg Hicks says the book helps tell the story of how Farm Bureau has helped members adapt to a changing farm economy and culture. Farm Bureau reacted to so many things and, and was proactive on a number of things that went on with uh, the agriculture industry during that period. Uh, one, of course, the tobacco buyout and, and the end of the quota system and also the end of the quota system for peanuts. And our legislative uh, work on things like the eminent domain constitutional amendment, uh, things like this. Farm Bureau was heavily involved at our agriculture issues, others right to farm, the right to farm law, and, and many others. Farm Bureau's insurance affiliates began operations in 1950, and various marketing options were offered to members over the years to help receive better prices for their commodities. Today, tens of thousands of Virginians are Farm Bureau members who don't own or work on a farm. They join to take advantage of those economic services, including health insurance. And while the number of farms and farmers in Virginia is slowly shrinking, Pryor remains optimistic for the next generation. And I think young farmers have a very bright future to look forward to. And and certainly Farm Bureau does everything it can to promote young farmers, get them involved. We also have a very successful agriculture in the classroom program where even at a younger age, Farm Bureau is involved in educating young people. And certainly, if I may add, our state fair that we became a part of, we became owner of that. And that my, for my reason for that is that we could expand agriculture, we could show it to the urban population, and more important, we could have young people involved in exhibits and competitions and, and just showing what agriculture is to the state. Entering its 91st year, the Virginia Farm Bureau is many things to many different people. But Pryor says at its core, the Farm Bureau is still focused on speaking for farmers and representing the values of rural Virginia. In Goochland County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay